Okay, welcome everyone to week number eight, the penultimate week of with code. Um, so if we got to the end of last week's bonus homework, we should hopefully be feeling a little bit more confident with React now. Um, so last lecture we covered context, we covered using material UI to make our lives easier in terms of design decisions. Um, and we actually got like a fairly substantial looking front end app done at the end of last week, uh, making a medlib site uh, where you could generate your own medlibs uh, based on some simple forms and some pretty looking React. Um, and last week we were also making some requests to an API. We were getting different sets of data randomly from our API. And we've done this a few times as well, just generally during the course. We've been making these requests to backends, uh, get requests asking for a list of resources. Um, we've talked about lots of other types of requests that we can use as well. But that side of things so far has remained a mystery. So in this lecture, we'll be talking about the backend. We'll be introducing a library called Express which is a JavaScript library that runs on Node that makes our lives easier setting up these servers. We'll be creating some routes. Uh, we'll be talking about middleware and we'll also be talking about MongoDB, which is a database. So we'll have a little bit of an introduction to databases as well. So we might have heard of this word, the MERN stack, M-E-R-N. This is one of these kind of hot words that gets tossed around everywhere in job postings. You might hear people say, okay, we want someone specialized in the MERN stack. Talking about a uh, stack in general is sort of a collection of technologies that a particular company, a particular application uses. And MERN stands for MongoDB, which is this database that we're learning about, Express, for writing our server code, React for the front end, as we've done already, and Node is the runtime environment where we're actually running the code. Um, so we've been using Node already, actually, to host our React applications. Whenever we write npm start, that's using the, N the Node package manager. Um, there's also a website called npm that we've been referring to quite often. Um, so that's all Node. Uh, the React server, when we, when we get this sort of hot reload function where we can change something in our React code and something updates on the screen, that's all happening because Node is running a program in the background on our computer, which lets that happen. So uh, in general with backend programming, I introduced these two, these two doodles from a few weeks ago, just to sort of illustrate the concept. Um, we said that with a REST API, this is the sort of API that we're using, um, REST stands for resourceful state transfer. Um, so we're sort of thinking about each thing that we store on our server as a resource. And with those resources, we have a few different actions that we can do with them. So uh, typically, we might have uh, one resource, which is sort of like uh, one branch of a restaurant. Um, so this is this would be uh, the the domain, uh, you know, mysite.com slash articles. Uh, and we said that, okay, we have different methods that we can attach to each domain. And for each domain, there's a different expected behavior. So you can think about it as there's a person behind the window who's uh, sort of stepping the drive-by and by convention, these different methods should do different things. So in this lecture, we'll be talking about what goes on behind the window, and we'll be trying to code up some behaviors for ourselves uh, for creating one of these APIs. So as a quick recap, as a quick recap here, um, we talked about HTTP request methods. Um, so this is from maybe a couple of lectures ago when we introduced, uh, introduced APIs for the first time. Essentially, we have five different methods. We have get for grabbing something, uh, post for creating something, 
patch and put for updating something slightly different between those two and delete for deleting something. Uh, and we might have something like this. Uh, these are some examples of some routes and the route is just the method plus the domain. So you can think about it as one particular window of one particular restaurant in a chain of restaurants that's serving up whichever resource we are selling. Um, okay, with backend programming, uh, we typically store our data in two different types of database. One type of database is called a relational database. Uh, you might have heard of something called SQL. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Uh, it's a special type of uh, it's a special type of syntax for gathering things from a database. And typically, with a relational database, our data is in the form roughly of a spreadsheet. Uh, we might have a, a spreadsheet that tracks every user on our application. Uh, and each one of these spreadsheets might have various rows for different users. Uh, then we might also have, uh, let's say, uh, posts by that particular user or comments by that particular user. So we have a comments table, which uh, maybe has like the user's name, the time that the user left that comment, um, the, uh, the message that the user left, for example. Um, and with a relational database, we typically have one sort of connector database in between, which simply maps from one database to another. Um, so this is sort of a really confusing way to set up a database, um, but sometimes this is quite effective. Uh, there's a little bit of an art to deciding what kind of database that you want to use in a given project. Um, typically with relational data, this works well when you have lots of uh, nodes in your data that are connected to many different types of resources. So for example, a really good, a really good example is something like Twitter, where uh, you have a table of users, you have a group of users, and we need to track relations between that user and hundreds of other users. Um, so we can tell, is this person following the other user? Is the other person following the other user in reverse? Um, the user might have uh, lots of posts that need to be tracked. Then the posts can have comments from other users. So there's lots of these sort of uh, overlapping entities that are interacting with each other. So in general, that's the sort of situation where it makes sense to have a relational database the other type of database that we'll talk about in this lecture is a non-relational database, otherwise called a NoSQL. So you have SQL and you have NoSQL. And an SQL database is essentially structured like a giant JSON document. So JSON, we talked about a few lectures ago, uh, it stands for JavaScript Objects Notation. And essentially it's just like a massive JavaScript object holding all the data that we could want. Um, and the pro of this is that it's so much easier to work with. Uh, you can simply add different fields onto this giant uh, JSON document, essentially. You can edit things just like you are using a real object in your JavaScript. Uh, and you can just change, you can change whatever you're putting on each object at will. So whereas with relational databases, they have more of a script, uh, sort of a, a strict schema of what things belong to each type of entity. So a user always has to have an email address and a name and uh, a birthday, but we couldn't suddenly add something new onto it. With relational databases, you can really just add anything completely ad hoc, and you don't need to do a really complicated database migration to to do that. Um, you can just add anything onto the object and it's totally fine. Okay, so that's a little bit of background on uh, databases, uh, which we'll be covering towards the end of this lecture. Um, so next thing I wanna talk about is Express. Um, we'll be talking about uh, why we need Express, what is Express. Uh, we'll be showing some demo code of how Express works. 
Um, and we'll be creating what's called a CRUD interface, uh, which we'll need to set up for pretty much any backend that we want to create. So Express, it's a JavaScript library, just like React, just like React Router, just like uh, pretty much everything we've been using the last two lectures. Um, it's a set of functions, a set of black boxes that we can tap into whenever we want, um, which are all hosted for free online. Express runs using Node.js, which is a special set of technologies that allow us to run JavaScript that can interact with our file system, um, which we're using already for React, as I mentioned before. Express is a really popular framework. Uh, loads of companies are using the Mern stack now. Um, you might have also heard of something called the Mean stack, M-E-A-N. Uh, that's the exact same thing, except it uses Angular for the front end instead of React. Um, and it's also quite simple. Uh, there isn't too much to know with Express. So I think we'll probably cover maybe 70, 80% of everything that there is to know about Express in this lecture. Um, and then finally, it's actually really fast. Um, there's a comparison done fairly recently between uh, Ruby on Rails, which is one of the fastest uh, one of the most popular, at least, <laughs> backend uh, back frameworks or full stack frameworks that people used to use quite a lot, uh, maybe like 10 or so years, years ago. So Twitter was made originally with Ruby on Rails. Um, what else? Uh, Airbnb, I think, was made with Ruby on Rails. Uh, like a bunch of these startups uh, all came, uh, all originally were made with Ruby on Rails. Um, and they did some comparisons between Ruby on Rails and JavaScript recently, um, where Google sort of invested lots of money into trying to make JavaScript as quick as possible, and um, I think I think that I think that the, the JavaScript engine uh, which Express used ended up being I think ten or twenty times faster than Ruby for making a backend, which is super impressive. Um, so that's just a little bit of. A uh, bit of a sales pitch on why we're choosing Express, why we want to use Express. Uh, there's also the huge benefit that everything is still written in JavaScript. So the skills that we've been learning for the last four or five weeks uh, will totally transfer on to becoming a back-end developer uh, as well as a front-end developer. So to set up Express for the first time, uh, we can use the npm command. So this is the node package manager. We've been using this a little bit with React already. Um, and the deal is we can just use uh, the command npm init and using a name of a folder that will create a new folder, which is a new node project. Um, that will come with a package.json file, which will make our lives easier, which will allow us to install more things. Um, and then we can use the command npm install express which will download all of the dependencies uh, which are required to run Express and will allow us to use these files inside of our code. Um, by default, when we run this first command, we also get a file called index.js, which we can use to put our, our code inside of, essentially. Um, one problem with this is that we have to refresh this server every single time we make a change, which can get quite annoying. Uh, we have to sort of restart the server and start it again every time something changes. So there's a package called Nodemon, uh, which you can install globally on your machine, which will sort of just recurrently start doing, start reloading like a hot reload feature. Whenever something changes, it will stop the server and, and restart again. Uh, uh, one small thing with Express, uh, we still have to use this old fashioned require syntax with Express. Uh, even though ES6 came out I think, like five years ago or so, uh, Node.js doesn't support uh, the new import export syntax. So the new syntax looks something like this. Um, we can define an export on a particular file with module that module the exports. I think there's actually, there actually might be a spelling error here. Um, I need to check this later on. 
Um, and as long as we've exported something from one file, we can then require it from another file, and we can store the result of this in a variable. Um, so in this case, we had a constant called name, which we define in otherfile.js. And then in index.js, we can require that file using a relative path. And if we store that in a variable, then it's, it's basically the same as us having that variable in the other file. So every Express application will look something like this. We always pretty much have this exact same setup. Uh, we just simply need to re require the Express library, uh, which is available to us because uh, we installed it in our package.json file. Um, we need to initialize the Express server uh, just by calling this Express function. Generally, uh, we store this in a variable called app. Um, and then creating one of these endpoints looks something like this. Um, so in this case, this is a get method. Um, so we can make a get request to this route, like just a slash. So just whatever the name of our server is uh, with a slash at the end. Um, and then we can respond to that request using uh, something on the response object. Um, so I think there's a better slide that I can explain this with uh, next slide or the slide after. So I'll, I'll dive into this a little bit deeper then. Um, and then finally, we need to uh, we need to listen on a particular port for incoming requests. So this is the line to do that. Um, a port you can sort of think about it as a, a server when we're hosting something, when a computer is interacting with the web, uh, there are lots of different channels of communication that that server can talk through. Um, and we call these ports. So we can have different processes acting on different ports. And we can essentially just create any of these ports that we want. We can create any number in here and it will give us like a new channel of communication that we can uh, interact with the outside world with. So in terms of this, uh, this get code that we just, uh, we just went through here, uh, there are a few different uh, little, little things to, to know about here. Um, the first thing, the type of method that we're using is the HTTP method that we want to use. So it's the kind of, uh, the kind of window on our restaurant that we want to set up some functionality for. The first method is the path. So that is the string of digits, string of characters that need to be typed in uh, when we're sort of searching for our server, when we're making that request um, to get us to that particular address. So that's like sort of like the, the address of the restaurant in a restaurant chain where we want to head to. Uh, and then we have this callback function as the second argument, which we're going to fire this function every time we see a request to this particular route. Um, and this callback function takes two arguments. The first argument here is what's called the request object. So this gives us lots of meta information about the type of request that we got. Uh, if there's any if there's any extra details that we need to complete the request, like if there's uh, an object that, that got uh, added in that we want to create a record for, or if uh, we're looking for a particular ID of whatever resource we're using, then we can find that on this request object. And then this response object, we're gonna be using to, uh, to trigger some responses which, uh, which will show up on the client side uh, when somebody makes a request. Um, and then finally, we have this, this code that we're actually going to be running every time somebody makes a request to this particular route. OK, um, so that's the really basic code. I'm going to show a demo of this. Um, finally, in terms of actually testing these backends, uh, we, we can generally use something called Postman, uh, which is a free application, uh, which is super popular for testing our backends. Um, 
what this what this basically does is we can pass in a particular method and path. Uh, we can send a request. We can add in any extra information that we might want here. Um, and down below, we can see the response that we got back from the server. So after quite a bit of um, sort of introductory talk, uh, I want to just sort of go through a few steps of really quickly setting up one of these servers so we can see this sort of request response thing working out. So, okay, so from my home directory here, um, I'm gonna change into the, to the code files, yes. The uh, directory that I usually use for um, doing stuff here on, um, on my computer. And I'm going to use the npm init command with just a dem dummy folder name. We'll just call it uh, demo-express. Okay, so what this is doing is, oh no. Okay, this doesn't seem to be working. Hmm. Da, 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 da. It's not a, hmm. Ah, hang on, wait a minute. Okay, uh, let's try this again. Let's say we'll make a directory called demo react. We'll change into that directory, demo react. Uh, and then we'll just say npm init. I think this should work. Okay, yeah. Um, so here it's asking for uh, a package name, so we can just give this anything, demo react works. Uh, a version number, we can just go with 1.0.0. We don't really need a description. I'm just gonna sort of enter through all of this, uh, this sort of setup information. And uh, now if I go ls to show what's here, we can see that we have this package.json file. Um, I'm gonna open up my code editor here so we can say code and then a dot. And okay, so we can see this package.json that got uh, created for us. Um, and we can see just like React, we have a list of scripts that we can use. Um, this main property here is the default entry point for application. So we're expecting to see a file called index.js where all of our code will live. Um, next step, I'm gonna create that file. So we'll create something called index.js. So this will run when we, uh, when we, when we run the command uh, start, um, npm, npm run, npm run. Um, okay, so next step, I'm gonna open up a terminal here. Uh, this is in the same folder. And I want to install uh, Express. Okay, so this will fetch our Express code, which allows us to use the Express library. And we can see that it's, it's also dragged in lots of node modules which are required to run that package. Okay, so there are a few different lines that we need to set up in order for us to get Express working. It's very possible I make a mistake here, so bear with me. Okay, so we want to grab Express. Uh, we need to use the require syntax, passing in the string of Express. Um, we are going to create an app variable, which we get back from just calling that Express method. Uh, next, we want to set up a route. So we'll use the get method. The first argument here is the path that we want to trigger. Um, so there's sort of like this one example that everybody always uses where we can call the path ping just to check that something's working. And then here we have second argument as a function, so a request response. Uh, and as a response, we'll just say res.send pong. Okay, so somebody makes a request to the ping endpoint with a get method, and we get back the string of pong. Um, so hopefully this works. Uh, the last thing that we need to do is app.listen, passing in a port number. Um, so commonly for backends, we just default to the port of 5,000, 
Uh, but I've also seen 3001, 3003, 8000. Um, there's not really a strong convention there, but this is just something quite easy. Okay, so this is pretty much all of the code that we need to set up our express server just for this one route. Uh, the next step is to run node index node index.js. And hopefully this will start up our server and we'll be, be able to make a request to it. Uh, maybe that's is that running? Maybe that's running. Okay, hopefully this is running. So, okay, so I want to make a get, get request to localhost 5000 slash ping. Okay, and hopefully this just works. Hey, yes, that worked. So we get back this response of Pong. So that's what we're expecting. We made a request to ping, a get request, and we got back this text Pong. Um, another thing that might be useful to do here is just to log out this request variable just to see what we get back, just to get a flavor of what exactly we are, we are requesting. Um, so again, I'll just do the same thing again, uh, making another request. Uh, that didn't work because I need to restart the server. Um, I could be using Nodemon, but that takes a little bit extra time to set up. So I'll just, for now, just use the regular uh, node method and restart. So second time doing this, um, we get back the log in the terminal window. So this might be a little bit weird based on uh, what we used to with React and what we used to with JavaScript, where we can check our logs um, in the browser window. Um, but yeah, when we make a, a log with Node.js, we it actually pops up here in the, in the terminal. Um, so lots of meta information about the request that we just made here. Um, what could be a useful thing to check out here? There should be some information on the time and date when this request was made. Uh, okay, so this is, <laughs> let's see what's useful. Here we go, headers. Okay, so headers is sort of like the meta information about the request. Um, this is the sort of the user agent. So this is where the request is coming from. Um, so usually this would be something like uh, the browser that you're using, for example, or the operating system that you're using. Uh, the host, that's where uh, the server's been hosted, is localhost 5000. If this was a real application, then it would be something like api.mysite.com. Um, yeah, so this, this is the sort of information that we get. We get loads of information. Uh, lots of it is totally useless. Um, and we can use some of it to respond to our requests, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. Okay, so that's a really quick example of just getting something something working with Express, just showing us that we can make this window basically where we can respond to something from a particular route with some sort of data, uh, even though that data was just a useless piece of text. Okay, another thing that we can do is that we can pass data to these uh, request handlers using either something in the URL so for, for example, uh, so, so these two are both in the URL. Um, so there are two ways that we can pass data in the URL. Uh, we have on the left here, what's called query parameters. So after a particular route's name, we can put a question mark and then we can set different parameters using an equal sign. Uh, and we always space these with ampersands. Um, so here we're looking for, uh, we, we're, asked, we're requesting from our books endpoint, which in this case should give back all the books on our back end, hopefully. Um, and we're also passing in some data of uh, the page that we're looking for is number two and limit is number 20. Uh, so this is a really common convention that we tend to use with pagination. So uh, rather than asking for all 100,000 records in the database, we can instead uh, sort of move these, move, these, um, move these records into different pages. So we could say, okay, I want page one, which is the first one to 20, page two is 21 to 40, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, this makes it easier to deal with generally. So this is quite a common pattern. Um, 
So we can get these query parameters using the query object, the query property on our request object. So if we pass anything in, we get this thing called query. Uh, and here we're just destructuring and console logging these out. Um, and in this case, the page would be two and the limit would be 20. Um, so we can, we can pass information like this to our request handler functions. Um, another thing that we can do is we can use path parameters, which uh, path parameter is something like this. Um, so we can add a slash after whichever resource we're looking for, and we can declare a type of ID that we want to check for. Um, and then we can get the ID in the handler function. So we can do that with the params property. So this is an object. Um, and in this case, we're calling this ID because we have this wildcard character here in the path name. Uh, and again, we can, we, can, we can have access to this uh, parameter in our request handler um, just by logging this out, um, just by grabbing it from the params object. Uh, we can also pass data through the request body. Um, so when we make a post request, we have the we have the option of passing in a body when we make a request through fetch or a request through Axios. Um, so for example, we could make a post request with a, a title and an author field. Um, we can pass in an object essentially, uh, and again similarly. Um, before we had rec.query, which is the query parameters. Here we had rec.params, which is the path parameters. Uh, and we can get any data that we're passing in through the request body using the body parameter. Okay, so uh, another thing about APIs, um, there's something very common called a CRUD interface. Uh, which is pretty much defines how we want to interact with pretty much all of our resources that we're creating with our REST API. Um, so CRUD stands for create, read, update, and destroy. And basically we want to be able to enable all of these actions on all of our resources uh, most of the time. So th th being able to create something, read something, update something, and destroy something pretty much allows us to model that resource in our backend and, uh, and uh, allows for some interoperability between our front end and other backends uh, to make this as easy as possible. Um, creating a resource is as simple as setting up a, a post method. Reading is as simple as setting up a get method. Updating respond, corresponds to the patch or put methods. Um, we can handle this differently in different uh, interfaces. And then destroying, we can use the delete method. So usually we'll have something like this uh, for each one of the resources that we want to create on a server. Um, we'll sort of demark, okay, this is creating, this is reading. Um, typically we'll want something that allows us to read all of a resource or just one of a resource. So here we can use the path parameter to uh, explicitly say, okay, just one this particular ID of book. Um, then update, yep, same again. Uh, we pass in a particular ID and we can change the value. Uh, and destroying will take this particular record and destroy it. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is middleware. Um, middleware is an express term which, uh, which means that it's a function that will run every time that a request is made to a particular route. Um, so the way that Express works is that when we have our app.listen, when we're listening on a particular port and a request comes in, that request will pass through a range of different functions before it finally gets to our request handler and we can finally respond to it. Um, the deal with each of these middleware functions is that they look almost identical to our request handlers. Uh, we get the request object that originally came through. 
we get the response object, which allows us to respond if we want to. And we also get a function called next, which if we call this next method, this will move on to the next middleware function in the chain. Um, so you see it's possible for us to immediately quit from uh, one of these middlewares. Um, so for example, one of these middlewares could be checking if a user's logged in. Uh, so a user wants to see all of the blog posts on the website, um, but it doesn't, he doesn't, uh, they haven't been uh, logged in already. Um, so maybe there's one piece of middleware that's checking if the user's logged in. And if the user's not logged in, if we can detect that, then we can immediately quit out of that middleware function and send back some kind of error uh, saying the user has to be logged in, for example. Um, so we define a middleware function, which looks almost identical to the request handler. And we can attach that to our express instance using the use method. Um, so it's as simple as saying, okay, there's going to be one um, one argument to this function, and uh, we just pass in a request handler, a middleware function, which looks almost identical to a request handler. Um, we can also just add a middleware function to one particular route, um, in which case it looks something like this. So typically when we just had uh, one request handler that we were defining for one particular route, we just had two arguments here, but we can pass in another middleware function in the middle of these arguments. And this will only add that middleware function to this particular path. Um, so whereas with app.use, uh, every single route that we define, if we define a whole CRUD interface, then we'll run that middleware function before it hits each of these routes. In this case, we're just we're just using that middleware function on the home route, on the slash route. Um, so I have a couple of examples of different types of middleware that come up a lot in JavaScript, that come up a lot in Express, um, that are good to know about. Um, one of these middleware functions we get from Express, and it's called the router method. It's called the Express router. Um, if we call this router method on this express object and store it in a variable called router, then this creates sort of a separate little world of, uh, of interfaces, um, which we can then append to a particular type of path. Um, so this is just quite helpful to make our code a little bit cleaner. Um, if you could imagine that we might have hundreds of different routes that we need to define in our API. Um, so for example, here we have a, a birds route, a birds resource. Uh, we need a CRUD interface for our birds. And then maybe we need a CRUD interface for a different kind of animal that we have. And we have another one. Um, we could imagine that we have, uh, you know, maybe a hundred different ones of these. Um, so using the express router, just simplifies things a little bit uh, and allows us to put everything into separate files. Um, so typically we'll have a one folder for routes, which will contain each kind of resource that we're creating routes for. Um, and we can use uh, some code that sort of looks like this to attach a particular CRUD interface, a particular collection of routes to our main application. Um, and the way to use that is uh, we can use the use method again, which uh, takes in this case a, a path as the first argument, uh, the path that we want to use this piece of middleware for. Uh, and then secondly, we can pass in the middleware that we want to apply to that particular path. Okay, uh, another really useful two pieces of middleware here that we use absolutely all the time is the express.json method. Uh, so this returns a middleware, a middleware function that will run before anything else. Um, the express.json method allows our routes to understand and pass JSON data. So that's relevant because when we're passing in uh, a, an object using a post method, 
this object is sort of transmitted using uh, the JSON format. So if we don't have this middleware defined right at the start of our file, then our, our express server just won't understand how to read these characters as a JSON object. Um, so just a super simple fix, if we put this line at the start of pretty much every backend that we might want to create, then our, our post method will be able to understand uh, JSON, which, uh, yeah, it's one of these things that uh, it's an error that will pop up quite a lot quite early. Uh, and you just need to know this one particular trick. Oh, you just need to add in this express.json line uh, and that solves that. Um, and this second line, this is something to do with forms. So if we're posting something via form, rather than using a regular post request, then we need to, we need to use this particular line here, which, which somehow makes it work. Um, I'm honestly not totally sure how, how this line works. I just, need to, I just know that I get the errors if uh, we try to make a post request using a form. Um, so that's another thing here. Okay, so I made an example of a CRUD interface earlier that I can quickly walk everyone through. Uh, again, we're using this, uh, this books analogy. So we have a backend that has a collection of different books. Um, this looks almost identical to the demo that I just created here. Uh, we have uh, requiring express. Um, this, in this case, we're, we're, requir we're requiring a, um, a route called books. Uh, so this is a route. We're using the express router in this file here to set up a bunch of different routes. Um, we're using this express.json middleware so that we can read uh, a JSON format as it comes in. Um, we're using this books router for any endpoint that starts with books. Um, and then we're listening to requests on the port of 5000. And this second uh, second argument to this function just uh, runs a function uh, when that happens. So in this case, we're just making a helpful little log that says, okay, we started listening on port 5000, basically. Um, okay, so this books router, uh, we're just setting up a CRUD interface uh, with a dummy array of books. So we can see here, we have this, uh, this, this JavaScript array uh, an array of objects which are sort of standing in for our database right now. And in this books.js route, we are creating an instance of the express router. Um, we have to include express uh, to sort of set up this router. Uh, so that's why we have this here. Um, we're requiring this list of books from this file. Uh, and then we're creating routes, four different routes for the CRUD interface that we want to set up. Um, so in the case that we just want to get uh, just the books, so remember we're using this uh, use method with the argument of slash books. So everything that we're declaring in this file should essentially in our minds have the word books before it. So if somebody makes a request to localhost 5000 slash books, we'll just respond with JSON, so res.json, uh, passing in this array of books. So we'll just give back all the books, essentially. Um, in this example here, we just want to read one of the books. So we can use the path param here um, to pass in a number, an ID, um, using, using, the, uh, using the URL. So for example, we could be typing in uh, local, uh, local host, 5,000 slash books slash 123. So we'd be asking for the book with the ID of 123. Um, and okay, so, we, so we're so we taking the ID off the uh, params.id property. Um, then this function is finding the book in our list that matches that ID. So we have IDs starting at one, two, three. Uh, so we'll find that particular book and um, as long as it's as long as it's actually found, so if this if this returns nothing, so if there's if there's no book that matches this ID, will trigger this error message. Um, otherwise, we'll just return that particular book. 
Um, updating the first part looks almost identical, except um, except we're going to update the book. This particular book, we want to change the title of that book to whatever we're passing in in the title property of our body parameters. Um, so this one is a little bit more, a little bit more verbose, um, but that's updating. So we're just grabbing one of the books um, and then we're updating that particular book with a different title. And then finally, destroying a book where, again, we're looking for the particular book. If it's not found, we're giving an error. And then we're updating this list of books uh, using a filter to only return books that don't match this particular ID that we're passing in. <clears throat> so this is an implementation of a backend which just uses a, an array of data. Um, in practice, we, we want to store our, our data in something more useful than this. So that's why we need a database. Um, so the last section of this lecture that I want to talk about today is databases. How we set up a database using Express. Um, we'll be introducing MongoDB, which is a really common database provider for React, um, which uses uh, a NoSQL database type. Okay. So first off, MongoDB um, is NoSQL. So that means that everything is structured as an object. Um, it's pretty quick. Um, it's pretty easy to use relative to SQL. Um, and uh, we have a, a JavaScript library called Mongoose, which allows us to interact with a database in a more easy, easy less, less technical kind of way. Um, in MongoDB, we have this, uh, we have this sort of special language, which can be kind of confusing. Um, there are two terms that are sort of important to know about. Uh, one is a model, which is sort of like a database table. So you can think of this as like, a, um, there's, one, uh, there's one spreadsheet of entities, uh, a user's table, for example. Um, the model is sort of like the spreadsheet and the document is like one record in that collection of things. So a document is like one row in this table of users, for example. Uh, Mongoose, again, I said it's a JavaScript library, so there's a corresponding NPM page. Uh, this has 1 million weekly downloads, which is pretty big as well. Mongoose is a really popular library. Um, to set up Mongoose, we need to call these two lines at the start of our index.js file. So we're just requiring the library. Um, again, we need to use the npm install uh, command to grab those files to our computer. Uh, once we have that, we can use the mongoose connect method, uh, which is gonna take a URL of a database to connect to. So the way that this works is that a database is kind of also like a server. Um, Databases can be run on computers, uh, in which case you'll get some local host uh, URL. Um, they can also be hosted on uh, like a cloud provider. So I think the easiest way to get started with MongoDB is to use their Cloud Atlas uh, service, in which case you'll just have a regular URL which connects to some database which MongoDB hosts for you. Um, but either way, this allows us to connect with the database that we want to use. Um, that allows us to store things on that database and query things from it um, and run any other commands that we have in our files. Um, there's a concept of a schema, which is sort of like a blueprint of the data that we'll be storing. Um, and this schema can be used to create a new model. Um, and it sort of it sort of ends up being quite similar to the whole class object paradigm that we talked about a few lectures ago. Um, we can use the new method, the new keyword uh, to create a new schema, um, grabbing schema from the mongoose library. Um, and in this case, we we just need to define what the shape of the data looks like. 
Um, so here, each, each of these are property that should belong on the blog schema object in the end. So what are the columns of the spreadsheet, essentially? Uh, and we just need to pass in types in JavaScript. So types can either be a string, a number, a Boolean, uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, and in the case that we have uh, arrays of objects, nested objects in arrays and objects nested in arrays, arrays nested in objects and objects nested in arrays, um, we can just write out sort of declaratively uh, what that looks like. So comments on a blog is going to be like a, an array of objects which are going to look like um, a body, which is a string, and a date, which is a date. Um, so yeah, there's a few different properties that we can set with this, uh, but I won't, wouldn't worry about this too much right now. Uh, as always, much easier to practice on a real project. Um, so we have a homework assignment this week, which you can complete if you, if you feel like that. Um, and then finally, uh, we need to call the mongoose model method in order to create a model out of a schema. So again, a model is sort of like the uh, database table. So we want to create a new model. Um, and to do that, we pass in the name of the model. So in this case, we're calling this model blog. And then we need to pass in a schema, which is sort of like the blueprint of how to construct this particular model. Um, so typically, we could do this in one, in one file, in our index.js file. Um, but more commonly, we'll have a separate folder called models, uh, which will contain all of these schema files uh, and export these, uh, or export these models that we're creating, uh, which can then be imported into our index.js file. Um, okay, and then there's a few methods that we can finally use to actually connect to this database and actually link the routes code that we've been writing to our models. Okay, so first off, uh, again, we're going to follow this CRUD pattern. We're going to talk about each of the components to it. Um, let's say we want to populate this get request to our blogs. So in this case, uh, you know, the, the standard syntax is when we just have the resource name, we don't have a particular ID slashing after it. Uh, we're just saying, okay, give me all of the blogs in the database. Um, there is a method called find, which we get for free whenever we have a model instance. So this blog right here, this is just like an empty database with the name blog. Um, so that, that, uh, that thing, this object, this class instance called blog, this model, by default, it has a method called find. And this returns a promise, which eventually evaluates to everything in the database. Um, it turns out we can also pass in a argument to this to sort of say, okay, only find models with such and such a parameter in such and such a place. Um, but the simplest, the simplest thing to do, okay, just grab all of the models, uh, grab all of the documents in the model rather. Um, this will just return a list of all the blogs that have been added to uh, our model. Um, so this will eventually return an array and that array we can then respond in a JSON format, passing that back. And that will give us an output if we make a request on the client that looks almost identical to the output that we got from our dummy APIs in the last few homeworks, if we got that far. Okay, so that's how we generate uh, an array response of objects representing something that actually exists already in our database. Um, creating new documents, we have the model.create method. So we have access to this thing called blog. We can call the create method. And this just takes an object with um, all of the initial values that we want to set it with. So in this case, we can pass in a title, author, body, comment, blah, 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 blah. And that will create a new one of these blogs. 
Uh, and this will just add it to our model. So we'll get basically a new line in our database um, uh, corresponding to the one that we just created. Um, so typically we might have a body, a request body. So like an object full of data that we're trying to pass along with this request. And we'll simply use that request body to um, create a new blog using the data that somebody provided. Um, and by convention, we'll also respond with the new object that we created. Um, so this again returns a promise. Uh, it takes some amount of time for us to correspond with database and pass in this new value. The database responds, this, this await uh, promise eventually evaluate to the new record that just got created. And by convention, we also just respond to the request using this newly created, uh, newly created resource. Okay, so that's creating, that's CR, CRA. Um, finding a specific record, so with reading data from the back end, um, typically we'll also want to be able to pass in a particular ID and say, okay, give me this particular record in the back end. Um, so we're using a path parameter here. We have this wildcard for ID. Um, we can get that within the request handler using rec.params.id. We've seen this before a few slides ago. Uh, and we can use the find by ID method, which will specifically grab whichever, whichever item in our database that has the ID um, field that matches this particular, uh, this particular ID that we're passing in. Um, the ID method that actually just reminded me, it, we, we get the ID method generated automatically by Mongoose. So in this case, this ID will be like a really long string of characters and numbers. Um, and again, once we've actually found a resource, we tend to uh, respond with that resource uh, just by convention. Um, in this example, we're actually also handling the error case. So if we pass in uh, an ID that doesn't match something that we can find in the database, then uh, this promise will, will reject. Um, we won't be able to find that uh, this particular blog post on the back end. So instead, we're going to respond with res.status404. Um, in, uh, in terms of these error codes, you might have seen a 404 error, like a 404 page before online. Um, 404 generally means the resource that you're looking for isn't here. Um, so there's a nice, there's a nice meme somewhere where it talks about different types of error codes. And, uh, one good way of remembering it is a 404 is something you did wrong and a five or four or something is something that you did wrong and a five or something is something that the server did wrong. Um, so in the case of 404, it's like you are looking for the wrong resource. It's kind of your fault, uh, according to the server. Okay, yeah, and we're just sending back a message that we can then display on the front end if we want. Okay, updating, so cr um, to update documents, we have a, a method called find by ID and update. Um, so this looks quite similar to the create method. Uh, we pass in an object of uh, all the properties that we want to change. Um, the difference here is that we're passing in an ID. So again, we can use this wildcard using path parameters to grab this particular ID. Uh, and the difference here is we need to use this dollar set notation to, uh, to set whichever properties we pass in. Um, so this set notation, this is something to do with the MongoDB query syntax. Uh, this is kind of a whole nother, another kettle of fish that we could jump into. Um, using the Mongo query language. Um, but the easy way to remember it is you can just basically copy and paste this exact code and th this will do what we need to do in this case, which is update particular fields on our resource. Um, again, we're gonna respond using uh, res.json with the element that we just updated just by convention. And if we can't find that ID again, we're just catching that error and giving it back a 404 error. Uh, then finally, for deleting, we have the find by ID and remove method. So most of this looks almost identical to the patch and the get by ID uh, patterns. 
Um, except this time we're using the find by ID and remove method, uh, passing in the parameter that we're passing in to the path params. Uh, and then we're just giving that item back to the user. Uh, wait, no, this is wrong. No, uh, yeah, uh, no, yeah, 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 by default. Yeah, okay, we should, we should anyway give this back even after deleting it. Um, this is also by convention. So this, this line right here will evaluate to the element that we just deleted. And sometimes it's helpful from the client side if you get the element that you just deleted. So by default, you always, always respond with the element that we're, we're accessing, even if we just deleted it. Okay, so that's everything for this lecture. Um, this week's homework, we have some more videos fleshing out uh, backend concepts. Um, and the project for the week is creating an entire full stack application uh, with a to-do list. So we're taking the to-do list application that we made a couple of weeks ago, and we're creating a backend for it that we control ourselves. So you'll be able to add, uh, delete, uh, read, and update the, um, the to-do lists that you can use on the front end. Um, so yeah, finally tying everything together to get a holistic approach to web development. And hopefully you'll, you'll have learned something about both front end and back end in this course. So that's everything for today. Uh, as usual, homework is due by next lecture and next lecture will just be summing up everything that we covered in the course. And I'll be talking about a few areas of interest if you want to learn more going forward.